So it's my pleasure to welcome back Nelson Gray, who will be leading a discussion on building an international portfolio um, with some other guests that um, he'll uh, invite up in due course. Thank you. Hello. I'm pleased to be back, even if you're not to see me. <laughs> so building an international portfolio, it's a session on practicalities, issues that uh, might uh, need a little uh, enlightenment to help us and encourage us to, uh, to, to, to take our businesses international and to take our investments international. I'm in a privileged position that I'm, I'm, I'm able to travel the world, meet a lot of interesting people. Um, but I'm an odd choice to lead this session because the government in the UK have put um, significant barriers in the way of angels in the UK investing outside of the UK. Basically what the bastards have done is said, <laughs> If you invest in a UK company, you won't believe what they, I mean, this is, this is oppressive government as you wouldn't believe. If you invest in a UK company, then for every dollar you put into the UK company, we'll give you 50 cents back off your tax return. And if you make a loss, then we'll, we'll actually make it up so you get 75% of your, 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 your money back. Now, I think that's obviously very terrible, and I know you guys would resist that like hell, but it's one of the reasons that we have relatively little personal experience of international investing, because we're just locked into, uh, into the UK. It's sad. So it's also an interesting, uh, just aside from some of the discussions yesterday, that only works if we invest in what you have been calling priced rounds. So very unfortunately, I'm not allowed to get into the debate on convertibles or safes or any of that stuff. Basically, we just price everything and you get the same 50 page legals, whether it's 50 grand or 500, but that's a side issue. But I do actually invest uh, with some, uh, some, some uh, uh, international colleagues. It happens to be in the US. Um, and I'm certainly have become interested in making some connections here to look at investing uh, in Asia. Uh, let's ignore the tax implications because you know, okay, I can get a bit of a write-off, but you know, I think it's more interesting that we have the opportunity perhaps just to spice things up a bit. That's not meant to be irony or anything, by the way. I, I, you know, oriental spike. No, um, didn't mean that. I think it just makes it interesting that we could work with colleagues uh, 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 investing elsewhere. And this is about building an international portfolio, of course. So one of the things that happens is that you start off with a domestic portfolio, you take it international, and suddenly you've got an international portfolio. So it opens up a whole bunch of other opportunities once your companies are uh, uh, outside your domestic territory as to how do you expand that, how do you decide where to go, uh, what partners locally do you need to, uh, to keep driving the business forward. So. The last session yesterday, we had a list of uh, investment risks, uh, of which I think the last one was a kind of capital adequacy, capital structuring risk. Uh, and I think to those risks, we have to add two more if we're thinking about going international. We have to add country risk, and I suggest we also have to add fellow investor risk. So in terms of fellow investor risk, I am very comfortable investing with the people that I invest with because I know them really well. I understand their attitude to risk. I understand more or less how deep their pockets are. I understand if they're likely to follow investments on uh, what they're like to deal with if, when things get tough and that sort of thing. I don't understand that if somebody pops up and says, hey, I've got a deal in India, for example. I've no idea, I don't know those people uh, and what the fellow investors are going to be like. And, and I, I did say yes, yesterday, and it wasn't really in jest, that in some ways my fellow investors are more important than the CEO because we can actually change out and adjust the CEO, and we usually have to over the life of a company anyway. But investors are more difficult to. So 
I got comfortable with the American Angel Group I invest in by coming to events like this. It happened to be the American Angel Capital Association, but over a period of time, I got to know people and I began to understand them. So this is a huge opportunity for us here to start addressing that issue of investor, fellow investor risk. I think country risk is the one where we probably, and I would certainly be uh, nervous about going to different countries. There was a comment yesterday in, the, uh, um, in one, of the, one of the sessions uh, about uh, board structures. And it was a throwaway comment, it wasn't elucidated on, but it was simply, you don't want to be a board director in India. Uh, I don't know why, but clearly, <laughs> yeah, I heard that, it's a scary thing. So fundamentally, I don't know what the uh, rules and liabilities are of being a director or investing elsewhere. Um, there are territories I have been in where our type of investing just wouldn't work because there is no such thing as minority protections. The only way you can protect yourself as a shareholder is by having at least 51% of the equity, and that causes some issues. So I think most of us would, would approach international investing, international work with um, uh, caution and would seek help. But I, I'm going to tell you a, 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 a story that familiarity can also breed a de degree of complacency where we think we know what's going on. So there's three people who are, uh, were engineers uh, out of Aberdeen, our oil centre in Scotland, and they made quite a bit of money exiting a company in Aberdeen. And they decided to form an angel group, the three of them, because they'd enjoyed working together, and this was a way of keeping to work, working together. And they did a bit of investing, and they identified a company um, in the engineering sector and they really quite liked it. And between them, they invested about uh, three or f three, four hundred thousand dollars. And they had about five percent of the equity of that company. But they hadn't really done their due diligence, and they hadn't really understood some of the, the subtle legal differences. And the, the, the detail doesn't really particularly matter. But they ended up. You know, they put 300,000 in, they own 5% of the equity. They ended up being sued personally, cutting through the limited liability barrier for $12 million, joint and several. Now, the interesting thing for me in terms of how we address the issues of going international was that that was not a strange, uh, well, maybe it is a strange and mystical country for some. Uh, the company that was suing them was Honeywell, who was a supplier to the company they'd invested in. Uh, and the company had sued Sunny Honeywell for something and lost. And the company in which the company was based was England. It wasn't that remote from Scotland. We share very many common legal aspects but there's a couple of things which are subtly different, and they hadn't picked up on the subtle differences. So even in a situation where you're that close to it, just cause some pause for thought. Now, that uh, did scare these guys a little bit. Um, I don't know the exact number. All I can say is that action was settled out of court for a number of millions of pounds. But they learned a hell of a lesson, which is let's do some due diligence and let's get some proper advice before we go into a strange territory, even if we think it's on our doorstep, and even if perhaps we've lived there for a few years. So I'm going to bring up some people here. There's a, vi a wide diversity of experience here. We have uh, a corporate investor acquirer. Uh, we have an angel. We have a platform family office, uh, all with international experience. Uh, and I suspect all with some, uh, some scars on their back as a result of dealing internationally. Uh, and, you know, I am here to learn because, as I say, I've got those shackles of government around me that prevent me putting too much capital offshore. Uh, and what I'd like to do is welcome uh, Bob, Ryo, and Ashley. 
and you know, frankly, let's hear their stories, and then we can have a, a discussion from the audience. So we'll just make it easy. We'll start off closest first, <laughs> randomly. <laughs> give us a, give us a few minutes of your uh, your experience of, of going international, whether it's companies or investing. So I think I think uh, one of the scars on my back, uh, Nelson, was when I was uh, still in investment banking, and it was probably around. Uh, 15 years ago, and I'd been doing, my family had done a lot of business in Hong Kong and, and had a lot of experience there, but I'd never done anything in China. So I thought I'm going to be bold and I'm going to go out there, and I asked a friend of a friend to introduce me to someone, and uh, I ended up doing a deal with a guy in China. Signed all the contracts, did everything, and I didn't understand the landscape properly. Anyway, this was going to be a property deal which was going to last us, uh, would probably have a duration of about five years. About two months later, I get a call <coughs> in the middle of the night from my partner in China, in the property, and in his uh, broken English he said, you know, Ashwi, good news, good news. I said, oh great, what is it? He said, sold, sold property, sold property. And I said, what do you mean you sold it? We, you know, to who? No, 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 all good, make profit, make profit. And I said, well, that's great, but we, I didn't, we didn't discuss it. He said, no, 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 make profit, make profit, all good, money come. I said, okay. Anyway, the, 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 the moral of the story was that the money came and, and he didn't rip me off, but it, it made me realise I had no control, I had no nothing, and from that day, it made me say, okay, I'm happy to, I don't, I don't understand the laws and the, the, um, the values and the ethics are very different in every country. And what we think is, I thought it was unethical that he had gone and gone done something contrary to what we'd agreed. Um, he thought it was ethical that he'd made us profit and, and that he hadn't ripped me off. So it taught me a big lesson. So what, what I started doing after that point, I said, okay, I've got to build network and I've got to, I've got to go to places. I still want to explore. I want to go out to the world and build, build a network so that I can tap into that later, later down the track. So I think building an international um, portfolio starts by building network and meeting and greeting. And I think Jay mentioned it earlier, get on a plane, go somewhere, go to Silicon Valley, see it, um, go to... Israel, go to uh, Scotland, you know, <laughs> maybe, you maybe, maybe so not Scotland, right, yeah, yeah, maybe not Scotland, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, um, go, go see these places and, and, and the best way to get in, because it's a, it's, a, it's a very nerve wracking thing just to say, I'm going to get on a plane and go somewhere, but find, a, find a, uh, a conference that you can attend and boldly go there and just sit there and listen and meet people, and you might meet one person, and it happened to me, it happens to me over and over again. So now I join international trade networks. So if I pick a country and I want to get there and I don't know them, um, I might go and join that trade. They want me to come, because they're looking to bring business into their country, so they're happy to have me and I join those networks. I'm a member of YPO, an international peer network of, um, of CEOs, chair people, and MDs of around the world. It's amazing. I can I, only last a couple of months ago. I wanted to. Um, I was travelling. To, uh, I'm, I'm in Los Angeles every five weeks, and I needed to go to do some business. Uh, have a meeting on a, on the Sunday in Chicago. I didn't know Chicago. I didn't know anyone in Chicago. I picked up the phone on the Friday, and I rang a person in YPO in Chicago. Out of the blue, I went onto the database, I picked him, I thought maybe there's some synergies, he's in property, I'm in property. As soon as I said, hi, Ash Krongold, I'm from the Melbourne chapter of YPO, he said, oh, g'day, how are you going? You want to <laughs> catch up for a beer tomorrow? I said, perfect. That's the type of thing, and, and, and that's just one example of a network. So I would say it's more about, it's not about just going there and taking your business there. It's about meeting people, and you'll find that the person you met five years ago happens to resonate to a business opportunity five years later. So I think it's the networking side and it's the people skills and it's, it's the boldness to, to say, I'm going to get out there and do something, you know? 
what's your experience of because uh, you you move you've moved through s many territories. No yourself. one wants me. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, you know, it's always lovely to be introduced by such a charming and wonderful Englishman as Nelson. <laughs> uh, <laughs> contrary to popular... I do take after my mother's side, yes. <laughs> <laughs> contrary to popular belief, I am not ABAC's comic relief. You know, um, I, I think for me, I mean, I, I'm not an angel. I tried a few angel things, um, and it didn't quite work out. Predominantly because of stupidity, uh, mine. Um, what I am is, is kind of a venture manager, so put a little bit of cash, but hands-on. You know, I take a very hands-on way to drive the teams because it's both my expertise, uh, and I got a very small pool of cash. You know, I'm an Indian, so I got a daughter who has to go to Harvard, Stanford, and Yale. Uh, again, I'm an Indian, so if she can get a scholarship and do them all together. One time, he's sweet. You know. Um, it, you know, we, we talk a lot about legislation. We talk a lot about tax. I, I get it. Um, there's a lot of these constraints. Um, there's a huge number of incentives. But maybe to give a slightly different perspective, uh, to me, and, and I heard this from someone many years ago, you know, startup is a contact sport. Uh, and, and I use that with all the startups. I do a lot of free mentoring because I, I enjoy working with these bright young sparks. It, you know, you've got to get out and meet people. And, and a few simple examples. Uh, the, the two, three things that I dropped the ball on, uh, the angel things, a little bit of money. One was a property deal in Palau. Uh, I realized after going there that there's a population of 20,000, a good portion of which happened to be in um, sing-song bars, apparently. You know, uh, didn't quite work out. Uh, one was in the deepest, darkest Africa, or, or with a friend, but I trusted him and he still worked together and we're working on something now which, which we think will pay off. Um, I, I happened to meet uh, Morris uh, at uh, Melbourne Angels at the AAAI. I, I met Jordan, unfortunately, the year prior to that. Um, for, for what it's worth, he's not allowed to ask questions on okay. this panel. Thank you. Um, it, you know, I mean, just as an example, Morris and I uh, are having conversations every, every six to eight weeks. Uh, I, I happened to mention to him a team that I was mentoring, an Aussie team. Met her in, uh, in, in Hong Kong. I've been mentoring her for a year and a half. They raised through Melbourne Angels and a few others a sizable chunk of money. I'm, I have the pleasure of sitting on the board. Um, we caught up on Wednesday looking at each other. Morris, Rayo, I have less hair here, more hair here. Yeah. You know, he's a little bit whiter up here. We haven't seen each other for two and a half years. And after a half an hour's coffee, we're already <laughs> talking about how we can hook up one of his investee companies, which is very much EU focused, into Asia because that's where one of the investee companies that I'm involved with. We've just started lining up some channels to market. For me, it's really about people. And it's about understanding, uh, I guess, how you can build on each other's opportunities in terms of market knowledge. Um, my approach is, uh, this, this isn't meant to sound the way it's probably going to come out. Money is a commodity. Uh, and angels put a lot of money in. But everyone has said it's the heart. It's the passion. It's kicking the entrepreneur when they're down, up. It, it, it's, you know, it's all the good things that we do, and a huge part of that for, for what I do with my partners is it's about market access. We've built great relationships across Asia. I can go to a, a, someone in the corporate, actually, I do have a deal for you. Um, and say, That's number four. Uh, and say, you know, relationships say, look, you know, we're about to invest in this. Would it fit? Not, a, not an acquirement. You know, we use them as channels to market, distribution channels. What do you think? Where's the fit? Um, so for me, it's, you know, I'm just putting a few examples out there. There's a lot that can go wrong. It's about people. One other thing to bear in mind, I was talking to Marsha at dinner last night, and she said, hey, you know, I found out that VIF has this great scheme. You know, they support. And I said, nothing compared to Asia. You know, in, in Malaysia, I, I'm an approved uh, investor with the fund in Singapore. We put in a dollar, they'll match it for a dollar up to about 130,000 US. Equity. Um, there's a whole lot of other relationships like that in Singapore and Hong Kong. You know, you are able to actually have your cash leverage spectacular opportunities in these countries as well. A few hooks, you know, they've got to be local companies, obviously, because it's taxpayers' dollars. So, so there's, there's pros and cons for this, but if you find the right people, um, the, and that's really what these sorts of things are about, I think you can navigate. And you have to deal with all the issues around the tax, the legislation. And hopefully, the local partners can help figure those sorts of things out. 
Bob, I'm surprised. I mean, this must be a slow crowd. You've only got four. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, I think they don't know how to talk to me yet. So, so uh, you've got a, you'll, you'll have a huge amount of experience of going to different countries and the, and the issues of addressing different countries. But just, just to start, I, I heard a comment from uh, somebody when we were in Hong Kong last year who was in telecoms. And he says, we get approached by companies all the time. And one of the problems is um, they haven't talked to us. So they have customers in the wrong place. How do these people decide where to take their companies out of New Zealand? Yeah, that's and, it. and I guess that's based on the premise of do they need to take the company yeah. out of New Zealand yeah. in order to get your attention? Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a good starting point. Um, and I, I will give you a perspective that's obviously not as an investor, but as an acquirer. Uh, as the slide I showed you yesterday, you know, almost 70% of the deals that we've done over the last three years have been international companies. Uh, and they, they teach us something every single time. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, the tax law in Israel uh, treats uh, a company differently than the U.S. tax law does. The, the uh, Israeli tax authority wants to tax the entire value, the entire price that you pay for the company, whereas the U.S. actually taxes at the IP value. So there's a giant tussle, right? I showed you that there were two Israeli deals that we had done over the last year and a bit, it's taken us 10 years to try and figure out how to deal with the Israeli tax authority around valuation. Uh, so things like that really become very, very important. Another example is a lot of Indian companies actually like to house their IP in Singapore. Well, that's great for them from tax purposes when they're a small company, but the acquirer, that's not a good outcome. So things like you know, those kinds of learning, or here's, here's a great one for, for a green button. Um, don't buy companies that actually are, their, their offices are next to a brothel. <laughs> it's fine when it's green button, but when the Microsoft band goes up. <laughs> Tune Billy, there you go. What, I mean, was it, was, it, was it a next door building or was it just two doors into the same building? <laughs> yeah. there's, there's a bunch of HR violations that could start here, so I'll just I'll start. I'll start. Um, but there are, there are also some other really interesting things, and, and this is probably something now as you're, as you're managing your companies, that this is as much for you all as it is for them. Um, for example, the, US, the use of OSS is fantastic for accelerating time to market. However, they really need to understand the usage of OSS. There are some real tricky things, like copyleft, that if a, if a startup is using software that's underneath that type of licensing, it's almost unbuyable. So, so you gotta know some of that stuff for, for Microsoft, not, not for every company, but that's how we have a very strong position on IP. And so we have to understand kind of those things at a level of detail. That leads my, to my second point on this. I, I mentioned this yesterday, but it's, it's really critical. Um, transparency to the point of pain. When there's dialogue happening, and we're trying to figure out whether this is something that would work for both companies, a level of transparency that is uncomfortable for the founder is really required. Because what ends up happening is, if you don't have that transparency, you slow things down, number one. Number two, um, we're gonna find out at some point, and, and the deal will fall over if it's either lack of business transparency or technical transparency for, for, maybe, for maybe not such good reasons. So all those, all those things are really, we learn on every single deal how, how to navigate the different dynamics. Uh, the last thing I'll say to this audience here, and, and this is particularly true for um, international consideration. Um, as I mentioned to you yesterday, I'm the API to Microsoft for you, for th all things cloud, right? But I have huge expectation now on this audience that you're going to be persistent, you're going to be knocking on my door, you're gonna be bringing deal flow so that we actually know what's going on in these markets. I can't be everywhere. And so guys like me can't be everywhere. So we have a huge dependency on these, these, these organizations that actually are federated and give, give us much more visibility into, into the market. It's a huge value to us, but I think it's actually truly the value that you bring to your companies is to be a, an advocate for them with acquirers, okay? Last comment I'll make is, and everyone talks about this in New Zealand in particular, um, global scale, right? Going for global scale. 
Actually, that's not really most important to me. What's really most important to me is that the product, the go-to-market, and the pricing are designed for global scale. Every market's a bootstrap market, right? That's, that's reality. And, and every, sell, every organization can't have salespeople in every geography, right? We get to because we're mammoth. But designing and architecting the product, the sales model, the, the go-to-market, all of that for, for global scale, that's probably the single biggest learning for every acquisition we've done, whether that's you know, US-based or, or international. And <clears throat> do, you, do, you, do you have uh, a, a, a experience of how to decide this country, not that country, uh, based on local, local skill strengths or technology strengths? Because you know, we, we heard a debate earlier about um, Silicon Valley v. Dragon. But I wonder to what extent that debate gets clouded because one is good for one type of business or a certain type, a certain thing. When you go somewhere else, it's actually more about life science in San Diego than um, yeah. web tech or mobile in somewhere else. How, do you do a lot of research on that? I, I, I do, and, and I, I pick the countries that are after, the, the, if it's a technology or innovation, I mean, if we're talking our crowd specifically, our crowd looking, we're, we're looking globally all the time and we pick the countries that are, there are certain countries like for example in Australia, and calling it home, and I'm sorry to talk about Australia because I know that none of you actually like us after, <laughs> it's all right. after, after hearing your MP, after hearing your MP, we like you guys, so um, um, I know that Australia has a, has a, a real um, skill base in medical technology, right, and, and what we haven't done well in Australia is exporting that technology. So our crowd have picked that up and said, well, let's, let's go to Australia and let's target those angels and those um, founders of businesses and the professors and the universities specifically about medical, right? Whereas in another country, we, we'd go for something different. We'd go for um, more health sciences if it's Specifically, in uh, I know in Southeast Asia, there's a lot of health sciences. Um, so, and in that regard, our crowds had some major successes by not trying to target everything in the one country. And I'm using Australia as an example. Um, I could pick, say, in the, um, I know that in the in the Netherlands, for example, they've got some really amazing technology when it comes to building a, um, and developing grids for individual homes, power grids, to take you off the, off the major power grid and bring you just to your own home or within a conglomerate of, of four homes. So you don't have to worry about power sources coming and they use it via solar. They're at the forefront of it. So we've targeted Netherlands and said, okay, when it comes to solar um, based power grids for residential homes, we're gonna to speak to those people in that, that country. So. Again, Nelson, yeah, so the answer to your question is yes, we do. We, we look and we target at different times. It does change. Countries change their, their, um, their strengths over time um, and they change their directions and paths. But I think you can't be all things to all people and, um, and that goes for countries as well. All countries have their, their specialities and, you know, Australia and New Zealand have such great agri strengths. Um, and tr are trading all the time with countries like uh, in the Middle East who need um, our um, understandings of water technology, etc. So we're picking and choosing at the right time. Um, the, I just wanted to make one point before it moves on, uh, just following on from what Bob said, is that I think one thing that I've noticed now that I'm in my I'll say I am early 40s, so I'm not, not that old, but I'm not that young anymore. I'm sitting in the middle. And what I've, what I've sort of understood is that everyone's got over the whole, the whole uh, when, when you're building up relationships with um, uh, internationally and globally, a lot of people have pigeonholed themselves saying, look, I'm, I'm in my 30s, so I'm going to deal with that generation. I'm in my 60s, so I'm going to deal in that generation. I think what's really exciting if you're trying to build an international portfolio is when you find going into that network to be a 65-year-old and call up a 
22-year-old in another country, and not as the mentor, but I want to learn from you, it, it excites them again. And, and to get to, to, to be a, a, you know, an 18-year-old and call up a 63-year-old person who's had real genuine experience, it's, it, it, that's how you make the, those exciting connections, not just pigeonholing yourself into gender-specific or age-specific. Okay, if that we're, makes sense. I believe we'll just a couple of few minutes. So, we got any uh, questions from the audience? Preferably, really difficult tax issues in <laughs> yeah. some of these jurisdictions. Bring on the tax uh, issues. <laughs> yeah, one thing that we find in New Zealand is that uh, whilst we collaborate pretty well at an individual level, folk like to row their own boat. So you end up with a very sort of narrow, but powerful, potentially quite powerful venture. Yet there's something similar in Malaysia or in Israel. So you could put two ventures together with much deeper um, market awareness, with, with much wider reach in terms of investors. And that would give you something real to build your portfolio around. Have you seen much of that sort of early stage <coughs> joint ventures around sort of start, I mean, Bob, you'd see a lot of companies, I suppose, you think, well, I've seen it yeah. there and there. There's three of those guys out there. Could they be brought together in some way? Um, yeah, um, I've never seen it done at the, at the early, early stage. Uh, and to be perfectly frank, uh, if I did see it, I'd probably run. And, re and the reason is because, and, and this is, I think, something also you should take away for this audience. Um, it's imperative when we're acquiring a company that it be a complete team. It can't be, and we, I see this all the time, the biggest failure for most early stage companies is it's a technical founder who has no idea how to talk about the business. So they only know the speeds and feeds and the bytes and the bits and all that. But they don't know how to talk about their customer. They don't know what the customer model is going to be. They don't know how to talk about price. I don't need them to know everything, but I need the team to be complete and balanced. And so to me, if it was somebody, if I, if I saw a joint venture thing starting to emerge, I would think that that's, a problem with team, not with tech. And so I would probably walk. Yeah, I, I actually disagree. Um, <laughs> sorry. <coughs> so yeah, I, but he's the buyer. Yeah. You're the seller. <laughs> <laughs> Your opinion doesn't count here. <laughs> <laughs> um, if it's very early stage, I think obviously the risk is really high, and that's so you might not put in as much money but that's where you're gonna, you've got to take a punt. And, and I always go by the adage, and this might, this, obviously, in this case, it might be really such early stage that it's too early stage for an hour crowd, but I think you've got, to, um, you, you've got to be able to lose what, you know, you've got to make sure that you can afford to lose that money. And there are lots of examples of people, um, I know, I mean, I was, a, I was a, a really, really tiny, small investor in Lending Club and it just went through the roof. I've made a whole lot of really small investments just because a mate said, why don't you put some money in this? Um, and, and I've lost my money, right? Um, one of my best mates put in $50,000 into Uber um, because his mate rang him up and said, look, I'm really trying to scrap this money together. Can you, can you just give me 50 grand? And that was a heap for this guy and he's made a fortune. Um, Startup, really early stage startup, Marcel, is something where you know you've got to take a punt, and I don't think you can do too much due diligence. You just got to go ahead and and do it. I'll make a I'll make a comment. We haven't done uh, a joint venture, but the artificial hand company that I mentioned uh, yesterday, it has actually bought two companies in the U.S. That as complementary technology. That I see all the time. Was. I, I thought was pretty going it, given it was still an entirely angel-funded company at, um, uh, as it goes forward. So that will work. Yeah. No, in that in that case, what what you usually see there, at least what I see is, when an early stage company buys another one, it's either because they're domain-specific experts that they want the talent for, or the tech is adjacent and therefore complementary. It's it's composing, right? What I in the description you had, that seems to me like three failing entities that are coming together to try to win. Right, which I would I would just walk from. Yeah, but we, we, we the, the 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 company bought one because it was uh, complementary technology that yeah. fitted well, yeah. and it bought the other one because the other company was an expert in U.S. Uh, medical reimbursement, and we needed that skill. Yep. All right.
Well, thank you very much for your time and effort.